All right, so in this lab, we're gonna take a look at different factors affecting the rate of a reaction, right? So um, in class, we learned that re some reactions are very fast, right? They can happen um, on the order of a fraction of a second, and other reactions are very slow. They can take hundreds of years. And so we're gonna take a look at some factors that affect wh why some go fast and some go slow. So the number one thing we're gonna look at here is the nature of reactants. And so what we say here is that some compounds simply react faster than others. And this depends on the identity, the structure, and the chemical properties of each individual reactant, right? So um, you have to know about the chemistry behind all of them to be able to make predictions about this. So in terms of this reaction, what we're gonna look at here is the oxidation of a metal by an acid. So we're gonna have some solid metal here. And we're gonna to toss it in a bunch of aqueous acid. So uh, the acid is gonna change, so I'm just gonna call the acid HA, and that's aqueous. So this here is our metal. This is our acid where A can be different things. It can be a chloride and acetate, uh, different things as you'll see. And so what's gonna happen is we're gonna oxidize our metal. So it's gonna go from zero to some positive charge, right? Depends on the specific metal, but it's gonna get oxidized. And so when this occurs, the metal will go from being a solid to an aqueous solution. Um, with probably the counter ion of the uh, acid. And so the H plus goes from being plus one, right? If the metal is getting oxidized, something else has to be being reduced. And so it gets reduced into hydrogen gas, H2, which has an oxidation state of zero. And so you'll see a lot of bubbles forming. That's the formation of hydrogen gas, right? And so that's reduction. And so how fast this occurs depends on two things. The number one thing it depends on is the strength of the acid. And so for now, we're just gonna take a look at some acids are faster, some acids are slow. We're not gonna learn about why just yet. Uh, you'll learn about the why when you get to the acids and bases chapter. And really more so the electrochemistry chapter. So we'll learn more about the why there. So then in our first set of experiments, we'll check out different um, types of acids. And then in the second set of experiments, we're gonna take a look at the identity of the metal. Right, some metals are easier to oxidize than others. For now, we're just gonna say, hey, look, this metal's reacting faster than this one. You'll learn more about the why when we get to the electrochemistry chapter. And so these reactions look pretty cool, so I hope you enjoy uh, this upcoming video. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is gonna take a look at the nature of the reactants. So in these first four well plates, I've got three molar sulfuric acid, six molar hydrochloric acid, uh, six molar acetic acid, and then six molar phosphoric acid. And to each one of these, I'm gonna add some magnesium strips, so we're adding the same reagent, and so it's the acid that's changing. So we'll see how they react. So we can see aggressive bubbling for the first one. About the same thing for the second one. Third one, much more mild. And then the fourth one, probably more aggressive than the third, but not quite as aggressive as the first two. You can see the first, the second one has already dissolved all of its uh, metal. And the first one is almost done. The third and the fourth still going at it.
And then these will continue to react until all the metals dissolve, but nothing's really gonna change too much from here. All right, so now we're looking at the second row of our well plates. All of these have six molar hydrochloric acid, and now we're gonna add different metals to the six molar hydrochloric acid. So here we'll add zinc, magnesium, and then copper. So let's throw in the zinc. Then the magnesium, much more reactive as you can see. And then the copper. So no reaction with the copper. And this will continue reacting until all the metals dissolve. You can see the copper has not reacted at all, and the magnesium is long gone. All right, next up, we're going to take a look at the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction. So remember that molecules must collide to react with one another. And not only do they have to hit each other to react, they have to hit each other with enough force to actually cause the reaction, right? So if you have A flying over here and then it flies over in, into B, right? Not only do they have to collide to form a bond, but they have to collide with enough energy. And so you can think of this in your reaction coordinate diagrams where we have energy over here and then the reaction over here. So we, here we have A plus B, and then over here we have our product A, B. And then there's some barrier here, right? Preventing this reaction from occurring. And we need enough energy to go over this barrier, right? This is your activation energy. And so the more energy we put in, the faster these molecules go, the higher the temperature, the more likely they're to collide with enough energy to actually react. You can also think of this in terms of the Arrhenius equation, right? K equals um, A E to the negative E A over R T. And so here we have temperature. And then here we have K, which is the uh, rate constant. And so if you think about the math here, it's a little bit tricky, but if you take your time and go through it, um, as the temperature increases, so does K. So when we increase the temperature, we should expect to see a faster reaction. We'll see if that happens. Um, our particular reaction that we're gonna take a look at here is again a redox reaction. So we're gonna have some oxalic acid, which is this guy over here. reacting with some potassium permanganate. As well as there's gonna be under acidic conditions, so there's some sulfuric acid there, to form carbon dioxide, CO2. Some manganese two plus, and then there's gonna be some spectator ions, some sulfate and some uh, potassiums floating about. And so if you think about what's going on in here, if you take a look at these carbons, right, they're going from this oxalic acid into this carbon dioxide. If you think about the oxidation states here, they're both plus three over here. And so they're plus four over here. So it's getting oxidized. And our oxidant here is the permanganate. This permanganate, if you think about the oxidation state of this manganese, it's plus seven over here um, and obviously plus two over here. Um, and so that's going to be reduced. And this reaction is really cool because permanganate is a really deep purple. While this manganese two plus is colorless. And so we can tell how fast this reaction is going by observing the disappearance of this purple color. So it's going to go from purple to clear, looks super cool.
Um, and so we're going to do this at room temperature, and then we're going to increase the temperature at about 40 degrees Celsius, see how quickly it goes then. And then we're going to increase the temperature even further to about 80 degrees Celsius and see what happens then. All right, so next up, we're going to study the reaction between permanganate and oxalic acid. To do this, we need to pipette out five milliliters of each into one of these test tubes each, and then we'll mix the two test tubes to start the reaction. So we want to do this volumetrically, so we want to be accurate. So we're going to use our volumetric pipette. You can see this one indicates that it measures out five milliliters. And so what we want to do is fill with permanganate first until we reach this little line, right? The bottom of your meniscus should reach that little line that indicates that you have five milliliters in here, and then you can pipe it out. So just to remind you how to use a volumetric flask, um, you have this little adapter thing, right? It goes on the top. You wanna seal it nice and tightly. And then to suck some liquid up, you're just gonna push this uh, little knob down, and it's gonna start sucking some liquid up. So I'll do the permanganate on screen and then probably the oxalic acid off screen. Or maybe I'll do both on screen. We'll see. So stick your pipette in here. Make sure it's fully submerged but not touching the bottom of the glass. And then start sucking some liquid up. You can see it comes up very nicely and controlled. And now we are right at five milliliters. So we can put it in our test tube. And then to dump the solution, we just simply press this right here. So once you press, it'll just dump the solution out. Cool. So now we've got our permanganate ready, and now we're going to want to do the same thing with the oxalic acid. Naturally, you're going to want to get a new clean volumetric pipette. So I've got a nice new clean one, and do the same with the oxalic acid. It's got exactly five mils there. And then just dump it out. Cool. Now we're ready to mix and observe our reaction. All right, next up, we're gonna mix these two solutions, our permanganate and our oxalic acid. And then as soon as I start mixing them, uh, you're gonna to wanna to start your timer and count down to see how much time uh, it takes for the purple color to go away. Um, we're doing this at room temperature. So our currently our room temperature is, come on, focus in. All right, it's kind of hard to read, it won't focus in. It's about 22 degrees Celsius, 22.0 degrees Celsius. So let's go ahead and mix this in and see this go.
And you can see all of our color is gone. All right, so we're gonna do the same reaction, but now at an elevated temperature. So I've waved out five mils of my permanganate, five mils of my oxalic acid. I've put this in a hot water bath, heated it up to we are at now 41.0 degrees Celsius. I've let it sit here for about five minutes to reach th thermal equilibrium. And I'll mix the two and we'll see what happens to the rate of the reaction. So again, we're at 41.0 degrees Celsius. And you can see all of our color is gone. So we can see as we increase uh, the heat, we increase the rate of the reaction. Again, we're gonna do this again at 80 degrees Celsius. All right, so same reaction again. Um, I heated it up further, allowed it to reach thermal equilibrium. Uh, we are now at 77.0 degrees Celsius, 77.0 degrees Celsius. So not quite 80, but we'll call it close enough. So let's see what happens when we start the reaction. And you can see that reaction was very fast. All right, next up, we're gonna take a look at the presence of a catalyst and see what effect that has on the rate of our reaction. So remember that a catalyst is something that increases the rate of reaction, but it isn't used up itself. So it's there at the beginning of a reaction and it's there at the end. So the reaction we're gonna be taking a look at is hydrogen peroxide, which is something you can buy over the counter. Um, it's often used to like clean wounds, although it's actually not very good at that and, and there's probably better products out there, but um, still commonly used, has other uses as well. And so hydrogen peroxide is relatively unstable and so it's always decomposing into water and oxygen gas. Um, and so if you have some hydrogen peroxide that's really old, it's no longer hydrogen peroxide, it's just water. This happens at a very slow rate. And so when you're looking at the hydrogen peroxide, you can't really tell that anything is happening. And so what we can do here is we can add a catalyst. In this case, we're gonna add some manganese oxide. And so the catalyst will speed up the reaction rate, right? So when we add the manganese oxide, it should go much faster. And we can tell if it's going faster if we're observing more oxygen gas being uh, generated. And we generally put the catalyst up above the arrow to indicate that it's there before the reaction, it's there after the reaction, right? The catalyst is not used up. Um, and then one final thing, you'll see me, I think in the video, I say that we're making hydrogen gas. That's not true, I, I messed up. Uh, nobody's perfect, it's oxygen gas. All right, next up, we're gonna take a look at the effect of a catalyst. So in this well, in this top corner here, I have some 3% hydrogen peroxide. Um, so you can buy this at kind of drugstores and whatnot. Um, and so this compound is actually relatively unstable. And so although you can't tell, it's actually reacting now and decomposing. So if you have some old hydrogen peroxide laying about, it's probably just water at this point. So we're gonna add a catalyst to this and see what happens. The catalyst we'll be adding is our manganese dioxide. It doesn't really wanna, yeah, it doesn't wanna zoom in. Oh well, we're just gonna add a tiny pinch into here and then see what happens. So just add a little bit. And you can see all those bubbling occurring. That's an indication of a reaction going on. So this is decomposing much faster than without the manganese dioxide. Those little white spots that you see are little bubbles of hydrogen gas. A little difficult to see in the video, but not too bad. All 
All right, so the final thing we're gonna take a look at today is the concentration of our components. Remember, we can put thing in brackets and that means concentration. So this A in brackets means the concentration of A. And so remember from our kinetics lesson, we know that rate is equal to the concentration of your reagents to some exponents. And these exponents, the vast majority of the time are greater than zero. Uh, there are times when they're negative, but it's, it's not very common. And so if you think about what's going up here, if these exponents are greater than zero, when we increase the concentration of one of these components, what's gonna happen to rate? Well, the vast majority of times it's going to increase, right? It's going to increase the rate. And so we'll see if that happens here. Um, we'll take a look at different concentrations of HCl reacting with magnesium. And so this is the same reaction as our first step. So we'll have some magnesium as a solid reacting with some hydrochloric acid of different concentrations to form some soluble magnesium 2 plus or magnesium chloride. So it's dissolving away, right? We're going from having a solid to not having a solid. Um, and then we're gonna form some hydrogen gas. So again, you'll see those nice cool bubbles. And then there'll be some spectator ions, some chlorides hanging about. All right, so finally, we're gonna take a look at the effect of concentration on the rate of the reaction. So in cell C1 here, we've got six molar hydrochloric acid, three molar hydrochloric acid, one molar hydrochloric acid, and 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. And to these, we're gonna add our four strips of magnesium. I've written down the weights of all four strips right there. And we're gonna go in order. Number one is gonna go in the six molar, two in the three, three in the one molar, and then four in the 0.1 molar. And then what you wanna do is write down how long it takes for these things to fully disappear. So I'm gonna add all four of them uh, kind of one by one, and you can look at the timestamp on the video to calculate how long it takes. Let me get a little bit zoomed in more view, how about that? So number one, number two, number three, number four. See, number one's already gone.
still have that tiny bit left. Still have this tiny bit left, a little bit hard to see. Alright, looks like it's all gone.